Okay, hi there, and uh, welcome to a special video looking at this particular question. Assess the view that a high level of national debt can be damaging to an economy. I've chosen this title. It's highly topical at the moment. Uh, we're living in a situation where the UK government having to borrow a huge amount of money over the coming months as the economic fallout from the coronavirus pandemic uh, widens. The level of debt, national debt, the government has climbed to well above 80% of GDP after the last recession, as this chart shows. There's just a few signs that debt was levelling off as a share of national income uh, in the last few years. But we know that the scale of the budget deficit will be much, much higher this year. And government debt likely will rise well above 100% of GDP, taking the UK conceivably into this table of nations with the highest national debt in the world. National debt, of course, is the accumulated debt of the public sector yet to be repaid. Japan has the highest national debt, just a shade under 240% of its national income. And I've highlighted there the United States, again, whose debt will rise uh, in part because GDP is falling, the denominator is declining, but also because the fiscal deficit is rising so quickly. So what is the case for saying that uh, uh, a government should seek to limit, control, perhaps reduce the scale, the size of a country's national debt. You don't necessarily have to build all of these points into a really good A-star essay, but I thought I'd go through a few arguments with you. The first argument is that a high and increasing stock of debt uh, risks leading to an increase in the tax burden in the future. At some point, debt has to be repaid, uh, and if taxes, sorry, if debt goes up today, uh, today's borrowing and debt could be tomorrow's taxes, direct and indirect. Linked with that is point two, that the, as the mountain of debt goes up, sovereign debt increases, it can become quite expensive to service. In the UK, well over £35 billion a year is spent just on interest on the debt. Some of that stays within the circular flow, of course, stays within the economy. But that kind of level of interest uh, payments servicing the debt has a potentially significant opportunity cost for the government. They could have spent the money on other things, including health, education, transport and the environment. My A star point, if I was choosing this question, would be that I would be making the case that perhaps higher taxes and interest rates can crowd out the private sector. If the government borrows more, that could drive interest rates up. And I'll take you through the crowding out view in a second or two. Supporters generally of small government, uh, typically free market economists, believe that a lot of public sector or state spending and borrowing is wasteful, it's allocatively inefficient. Typically, those sort of people prefer a smaller, more limited government with less in the way of intervention and, and, and spending. They argue that cutting the debt then allows lower taxes, both on income and wealth and spending, which can both increase demand and aggregate supply in the long term. Uh, typically, those arguing for controlling the debt typically tend to be fiscal hawks or fiscal conservatives who have a, a strong belief in limited government, keeping government spending down, borrowing down, ultimately controlling the national debt. Part of the argument is the so-called theory of crowding out. Now, this theory has been around for the best part of 40 years or more, became prominent in the mid-1970s, and I've, I've ordered these points numerically. Basically, the argument is that if the public sector or the government borrows more, that can crowd out, if you like, squeeze out investment in the private sector. Now, this theory rests on the on the financing impact of an increase in government borrowing. Either the government goes to the bond market and issues more debt, we'll look at that in a second, or fundamentally it decides to raise tax to pay for the borrowing. And fiscal conservatives argue that the government borrowing and debt therefore needs to be kept in check to keep market interest rates low on bonds and to keep the tax burden low over time. And if you do that, if you have lower interest rates, lower taxes, 0.4 kicks in. This then frees up scarce resources for the dynamic private sector to invest and grow. Now, there is some there is some validity in the concept of crowding out. Uh, a good analysis diagram to do is to think about the market for loanable funds, the quantity of which on the x-axis, and the real interest rate, the cost of borrowed money, is on the y-axis. There is notionally a demand for loanable funds. That's agents in the economy needing to borrow money. It could be me needing a mortgage. It could be a, a corporation like Apple taking a, a bond out. Or it could be the government 
go into the market needing to borrow money. So there is a demand for loanable funds. And equally, there's a market supply of loanable funds, people and agents willing and able to lend. Through the financial system, uh, the supply of funds comes from both domestic and external sources, such as pension funds, hedge funds, and insurance companies who typically you know, receive the premiums from people and need to invest in the market to, to pay out uh, any claims. Well, there's a market interest rate in this sense. There's a notional equilibrium market interest rate. If you believe in the concept of equilibrium, let's say the, the interest rate is 4%, which balances the supply and demand for loanable funds. Now, if the government goes into deficit uh, and increases their fiscal deficit, they need to go to the market, in this case, the bond market, to borrow more money. So other things being the same, or catrus paribus, that increases the demand for loanable funds, demand shifts out to D2. And other things being the same, that may well drive up the interest rate, that should be R2, not R1, from 4% to 6%. So in theory, in theory, increased government borrowing uh, can lead to an increase in market interest rates in the debt markets, the bond, bond yields, for example. And typically, bond interest rates tend to act as a kind of signal for other interest rates, including mortgages. So if the bond market is charging higher interest rates on loans, then borrowing costs for other participants, including corporations, could go up as well. Now, as interest rates go up, as interest rates rise, that can squeeze investment, squeeze spending in the private sector. However, you need to be able to challenge the view for a star evaluation. The view is that the government borrowing more money automatically increases the pressure for interest rates to go up. Well, the first evaluation point is it depends. It depends on the interest elasticity of supply of loanable funds. It could be the case uh, that the supply is fairly elastic. I'll come back to that in a second. The second point uh, depends on what the central bank is doing. Uh, quantitative easing or QE, uh, where the central bank creates money electronically and then goes into the bond market and buys up government debt, that can increase the supply of loanable funds as the central bank creates money for the purchase of debt. So, for example, if the supply of loanable funds is highly elastic, if there is a highly elastic supply, I've drawn this, you can see much more flat. If you go back, I've gone from fairly inelastic to much more elastic. Then for the same increase in demand from D to D2, we don't get necessarily the same rise in interest rates. It might only rise by, let's say, half of 1%. And of course, that's the case if there's a kind of strong uh, potential inflow of capital funds from overseas. Another issue is if the central bank can increase supply. So if the central bank increases through QE the amount of loanable funds in the market. In fact, in theory, if the central bank has enough money to go into the market and, and lend, then the rate of interest can come down from 4%, let's say, to 3.7%. It's not inevitable that a higher level of national debt always leads to an increase in bond interest rates, which then crowds out the private sector. It is not inevitable. The crowding out view can be challenged. Indeed, if we look at bond yields for the UK, this chart tracks the yield on 10-year debt all the way back to when I was born in 19, well, the early 1960s. And you can see that over the last 35, 40 years or so, the yield on government debt, yes, there's been ups and downs, but you can see very clearly there's a trend fall in the yield and government debt. Indeed, if you look at the blue dotted line there, since the peak of the budget deficit in 2010, a decade now ago, the yield on debt has gone down. The borrowing cost for new debt issued by the UK government has become cheaper. Now this year, the Office for Budget Responsibility is projecting, is forecasting that the UK government will rise borrowing, UK fiscal borrowing or fiscal deficit will go up to at least 250, perhaps close to 300 billion pounds certainly well over 10% of our GDP, the biggest ever peacetime budget deficit. Will that crowd out the private sector? Well, in theory, yes, but the bond yields suggest at the moment that no, in fact, there's a ready supply of loanable funds to pay for the borrowing. Indeed, in some countries, including Germany and Holland and Finland and Japan, the yield on 10-year government debt is negative. Uh, the negative interest rates suggesting uh, that the bond markets have a pretty pessimistic view of what's going to happen to inflation over the next decade. So what are the counter arguments? What are the arguments for saying that, in fact, uh, we shouldn't be necessarily too worried about an increase in the national debt in the next year or two? I think a really key point is the first one. Uh, 
that uh, government borrowing is often required to fund or part finance investment in critical infrastructure from sewage systems to flood defence to better motorways to high-speed rail to all kinds of improved infrastructure in health uh, and education. Now that investment, particularly if you can borrow cheaply, is important for aggregate supply and ultimately for our competitiveness. A rising national debt is also inevitable, inevitable when a country experiences a severe external shock, as we're seeing with the pandemic and the, and the, and the recession that has followed. Governments allow the automatic stabilisers to go through. Governments borrow more. It's inevitable national debt will go up. And as a share of GDP, it must go up because GDP is falling. And you can also make a case for saying that it's rational to borrow when the market interest rate on new debt is low. Borrow to invest in better roads, better transport systems, new hospitals, when the yield is low. Indeed, the risks of causing that crowding out effect are pretty limited and muted if those government bonds remain attractive as they do to the overseas investors. The British government has never missed a repayment on any of its uh, domestic debt. There is something called modern monetary theory, or MMT, which makes the claim that the central bank can buy almost unlimited amounts of government debt. There's almost like a ready buyer operating in the shadows. The big risk, of course, with that is that they create so much money that ultimately we get inflation. I don't think we're quite there yet. A Keynesian would argue, a Keynesian would argue, that it's OK for the government to borrow money today to stimulate the economy, because ultimately, if that's, if that's successful... You're going to grow the economy, incomes will stabilise and hopefully start to pick up again and therefore people will start paying more tax as the economy picks up again and that means that the borrowing could be partly self-financing. So is a high level of national debt a concern? Here are some A-star evaluation points. Well, in, in part it depends on the causes. Uh, if you've got a very deep recession, perhaps a depression, a rise in national debt is largely cyclical and uh, should should tail off and perhaps fall as the economy picks up. Second point, it depends on the cost of the annual debt interest payments, which depends on the yield. And as we've seen, the yield on UK government debt is low. It depends on the ability of the government to attract investors to buy the new debt. In that sense, the UK is in well placed to do that, perhaps better placed than countries such as Italy and Greece and Argentina. It also depends on the forecast impact of inflation. You see, if inflation goes up from, let's say, 2 to 3 to 4 percent for a number of years, the real value of debt will come down. Interest rates might go up as well, but sometimes a little bit extra inflation can be good news for just bringing down the real value of debt. And my real A star point, the one I'd leave right to the end, is, is this point. Is a high level of debt a concern? Well, it depends on value judgments. It depends on how best we choose to fund the NHS, how best we choose to fund education and environmental protection and social care, and ultimately which generations we think should bear the cost of doing this. Many of the infrastructure projects that we benefit from today are at least 100 years old. In that sense, uh, the previous generations have paid for them and we get a benefit. So increasing the national debt does raise quite important questions about what's called intergenerational equity or fairness. And uh, I encourage you to keep reading about this issue because national debt is going to be one of the hot topics in economics in the weeks and the months and the years to come.